Sweet. Thanks everyone for coming along today. So we're joined by Tom, Tom Bange, who is Director of Content at Juro, and he's built quite a content machine there. For, Juro is a B2B text legal SaaS, clarify that. And we're just going to chat with him about how he's built up his content empire, built a team, and offer any tips about building a role in content leadership. So today's format is pretty informal. So I've got a couple of pre-submitted questions people had, some of my own, and then we'll just open it out for everyone to ask Tom questions. If you just, just, just take your mic off mute when you want to ask a question, I think there's, we've got a small enough group, but that should, that should work fine. I value yeah. interruptions. So please do interrupt me. Wait, <laughs> everyone interrupt. Tom, do you want to start off by just introducing yourself and what you exactly do for Jury? Wow. Well, just my name is Tom. I've been at Jura for four years and one day. It was my four year anniversary yesterday, which is a very long time at one start. And I joined as employee number 12. So at that point, there was one other person in marketing. And now we're still very lean. There's six, but it's about to become eight because we're bringing design into marketing. But I've been with the company through, I joined just at the seed round. And since then, we've done series A, series B and grown to about 90, 91, 92 employees. Before that, I never worked at a startup. Or like I didn't really know acronyms like B2B and B2C, so I learned all that. So I worked for a bank before that called Investec, where I was doing content production. And then before that, I worked for Thompson Reuters, doing thought leadership, but before that in book publishing. I used to publish like big, weighty legal textbooks about contracts and shipping and stuff. And it was so soul-destroyingly dull that it motivated me to move internally to a marketing role, where I've stayed ever since. You're on the mute, Christina. I am indeed. Right. This far into the pandemic, you're still on mute. Unacceptable. <laughs> Never going to learn. Oh, that's really cool that you've had quite a journey and that you were at Juro from the beginning. And as Haman has commented, all shares vested for your four-year period, probably. Of the initial option award, that's right. Yeah, so what's, how's it been in terms of content from when you first started to where you've got it to now? So we've been through not just content but marketing in the comps yeah and I think we went through three phases in hindsight that are really easy to see the first was like the baseline is zero so anything we do is good so mm -hmm. just you take big chunks out of like your know, database and stuff start happening you get some growth it's all really good that was fine and it works for a certain point but if you don't really know why it's working it's not going to last for too long then we entered the middle phase which is what i would call the what the fuck phase which was we need to scale these channels predictably and what is this global pandemic thing and what will it mean for the growth of software businesses that lasted probably about a year and then partly due to strategic changes and partly due to a couple of key hires we started to get a really good idea of how the company is growing and what content was doing to influence that and we went into a very focused mode where for like a year, I would say, at that point, me and Sana literally did like two things, didn't do anything else. And then now we're in the third phase, which is the scaling phase. We've got like an engine over here, it works, put stuff in, money comes out, got another one here, that one kind of works. It's another one that I'm working on. And we're just trying to make everything predictable and, and scale without adding too many people. Mm -hmm. And just going back to a point you said, Herman had a question there. What were those hires, the initial hires that you made? So the team over time it was originally just me and content, and then I added a content writer who was very much kind of Sana, Sana's cool. I'm just talking about her like in abstract. <laughs> Hi, Sana. Um, originally it was kind of like, well, I guess like all first hires in teams like that, like overspill me, just doing more of the stuff that I didn't have time to do. So very generalist. And then as time went on, Sana became more a bit more specialist or rather a bit more focused on certain things and not other things. And then when it became clear that we had two really high value activities, one of which is SEO, the other is community, in that order, we made specialist hires into both of those roles. So a writer focusing just on SEO, Sophia, hi, and a community and events manager who joined us this year. But for the company in terms of key hires, obviously all of those hires made a big impact on content, specifically in terms of marketing channels. I'd say, the key hire in marketing terms was when, like as a whole, was when we hired a guy called Vadim about 18 months ago, or maybe a bit less than that. He built our data attribution model. It's very rare you'd find someone who's like creative writer, content person. I can also do really hands dirty, like funnel attribution of traffic and 
UTM code, wizardry and all that kind of stuff. We didn't have that skill and then we hired it in and then suddenly we had a good picture of what was actually happening in our growth engine. Mm. And that made it much easier to scale it. So that was transformative, I would say. And at the same time, we had made some of the key hires elsewhere in the business that were also really good. Oh, that's so handy to have somebody who could, has the brain of doing all that attribution and creativeness. That's very rare merging of skills. It was it? We hired a wizard. And it was at that point, so you were doing before you made any hires. It was just you. You were writing all the content yourself. Is that right? And then In the early days when I, when I used to do work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then Sana, you hired, was it straight away as a, an in-house person? You didn't have any freelance support at the beginning? I was probably in a company, how long have you been there, Sana? Three years. So slightly under a year, maybe 10 months in. Before that, it was all me. We don't really use much freelance. We've got one freelance writer at the moment who does like about 5% of the work that Sophia can do. <laughs> so, but like every little helps. There was a period when we did use freelancers, but both the uh, cost in terms of unit economics for freelance content and then also the quality trade-off was too severe and it just became really apparent we should just tie that well in mm. uh, which we did and did you find that was part, it's partly hard to get freelancers because your audience are so specialists it's like lawyers and does if I recall does Sana have a law, law background no law background you just went straight in okay former managing partner for channel center over there no i mean so sophia who we had for SEO content has a law degree and then worked at an seo agency and not to just like be too complimentary because she's here but like unicorn hire <laughs> very hard to find someone who like knows anything about seo and has subject matter expertise i was thinking about it before this call and i think all things being equal one thing i learned was like back in the early days i think when we were thinking about people to hire not just in marketing but other roles in the business it was like we can probably either hire someone who knows all about lawyers or someone who's been at like a you know series a SaaS company and i think it's sort of like like occasionally that's not it's not true that you're forced into that like it's 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 your own constraints that you're putting on there like other people don't really see themselves that way all that being said i would probably in hindsight always optimize for subject matter expertise because mm. like with something like SEO, it's really easy to get into the technical aspects of what makes something rank and convert and all that kind of stuff. But all they're trying to do at Google is like find really good content and show it to people. So the easiest way to like get really good content is have people who can write really well and know something about, like know a lot about the subject matter. Mm -hmm. If it's not really optimized for search, like you can solve that problem without needing, to, like it's easier to solve that problem than it is to solve the subject matter problem because mm. for like a high trust persona like lawyers they just have such a strong sniff test for bullshit that like they see through you in a minute if, if your content's like at all not good just you've lost trust immediately so for example we, we've worked with three or four freelancers and um, writers while i've been at the company and the other two that we don't work with anymore definitely knew more about seo than the one we work with now like a lot more but they just weren't that good at writing like they're okay but for the cost it just it wasn't really good enough mm -hmm. and the person we work with now is just leagues ahead in terms of the quality of content in terms of how it reads mm. and the lift the lift to get something from this is technically correct reads badly and make it read well like you kind of got to rewrite the whole thing and it's just the time investment that goes into that mm -hmm. it's much quicker to get well-written content that's poorly optimized for search and just optimize it for search so yeah always optimize for subject matter expertise is my tip yeah great great take worth paying the extra for that, that speciality yeah it's hard as well because like with lawyers like well legal content you really got two options brand new people who are super young and like you've just done a law degree so they know loads Sophia <laughs> <laughs> or people who used to be lawyers and people who used to be lawyers have probably learned quite a lot about ways of working and like salary expectations and cultural things that like don't really want them <laughs> so um all things being equal like you've got a limited amount of budget to spend but as a company so if you're gonna hire ex-lawyers i don't believe that writing words for you is the best place to like spend mm -hmm. that ex-lawyer capital yeah good insight there gonna if anyone's got any questions do just jump just 
unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in Zoom. I'm going to ask one that Beth submitted before. And she was wondering, is there anything you would have done differently looking back? And how do you ensure you don't hit a ceiling with what you can do in content to keep evolving and find new areas of growth? Oh, easy one, sure, Beth. Uh, <laughs> congrats to Beth on the, on the new arrival as well. So the first part was like, what do I wish I did differently? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think like if I break it into big strategic stuff and then really specific tactical stuff, like big picture, it's never too early to start creating in search equity so I probably would have focused a bit more SEO in the early days mm-hmm. it's that would have been hard because it takes a while before you understand the pain points that the product solves so like it's only worth capturing rankings if it gives you relevant traffic that will convert so until you have a good understanding of what people are looking to solve it's quite hard to build the right search traffic but I think I probably would have started that sooner Full Funnel attribution, like having data um, integrity makes everything easier. But just hold that a couple of times before we hire for Dean, but always with third parties. And then as soon as they move on or something breaks, like you sort of lose your data. And then also the community group that we have, I would have started that sooner because it's like a, uh, a VP marketing candidate being to you today, described it as a plot of gold, which is <laughs> definitely true. So I would have done that sooner. I think in terms of tactical stuff, just like mistakes we made, we used to have a bunch of our content in a subdomain. So we had it at blog.jo.com instead of under .com slash whatever. Mm-hmm. That was just a mistake. It's just poor. Like the reason we did that was because it seemed like such a boulder to get rolling to move out of the spot, mm-hmm. which is where we were hosting it. But the longer you leave it, the harder it is. We should have done that sooner, I think, because it has an immediate upside for your just user experience as well as your search profile Mm -hmm. I think probably we were quite late to nail down our like marketing fundamentals like value proposition that ideal customer profile the messaging framework and it's always too late when you do that but we sort of should have done that sooner because it just makes everything easier especially now when I'm delegating quite a lot of stuff Um, when people ask me questions I'm just like have you read this and then they're like oh yeah um that helps a lot Mm. so yeah and then the last one we should like say no more when we started to get really focused in late 2020 late 2020 yeah um and stop doing everything else things started to move a bit faster and the problem with it especially with like a content person who knows a lot about like words and how stuff should read you can get pulled into loads of different stuff in the business like product copy and customer emails and all this kind of stuff and like yeah you can help and it will improve the output but it's going to detract from your um, actual day job. And I should have said no to more stuff in the early days. Yeah, we made it. Yeah. Uh, what was the other question that I had? The other part was, how do you ensure you don't hit a ceiling with what you can do in content to keep evolving and finding new areas of growth? It depends. I mean, we'll talk a bit about SEO later, I think. But often what you view as a ceiling is not really a ceiling. So like a really useful exercise we went through for the first time maybe a year ago was segmentation of our content plan by intent so high mid low intent not even as nuanced as like transactional educational all that kind of stuff. and you kind of intuitively feel like high intent traffic is buying traffic and everything else is like not really worth it but it's not we get people converting to demo through our lowest intent pages and like as long as you don't push it too far all traffic is good pretty much like not cheap traffic that you you know if, if you need traffic like just to hit an arbitrary number just sponsor some tweets and get a load of russian bots coming to your site and it's worthless but if you have a content plan and this the content is relevant it doesn't have to be relevant to like people who want to buy but let's say in our case something that someone who is interested in lawyers or contracts might read it's all relevant because it just has this brand amplifier effect so they might come learn what like an exclusivity clauses or something in a contract and not buy, but now they know the brand name and then they might come back with a brand search a bit later. So I think your idea of what the ceiling is on your growth through content is probably artificial. It's really hard to max anything out, even if you get like the number one ranking for everything, like your conversion rates from click through in search console are not going to be 100% for everything. So you've always got upside to be gained from you know, click through from search and then click through on page and stuff. So, yeah. And then 
I don't know, like new channels. Because it's not just about acquisition. There's lots of useful things you can do with content. Like if I felt that there was nothing else I could do in my role to get us more leads, but the company still wanted to keep me, then I'd spend all my time helping the sales team and just do like case studies and sales enablement content and stuff. So there's always places you can apply for us that are going to help the company grow faster if that's the kind of company you work for. It's good not to get hung up on like ceilings and, and to panic when you think you're running out of traffic and things like that. Mm-hmm. What, what are you measured on as a as director of content? Are you, is it leads or traffic or yeah, what, what are you? Pipeline. So our main metric is inbound pipeline, yeah. which the whole marketing team is in some ways measured on it, but the two managers in the team, me and the head of demand gen, are both, that's our main kind of North Star metric. Mm-hmm. And then I have a few other ones like community influence pipeline, because it's such a big focus for us at the moment. We have a target around that. And then I also have a, so we, we do like a yearly planning exercise called like the master plan that the CEO writes, which is the broad direction we want to take the company for the year and then we redo it at the beginning at the middle of the year and in the master plan for some reason i committed to triple organic traffic in the year so i've got a traffic goal that's in you know month on month or quarter on quarter that is in line with that endpoint um, and we're on track so going all right but like to triple it in the year obviously key four is the hardest one <laughs> so, that, that's but, huge <laughs> how, what, how are you planning to do that uh aggressively <laughs> i mean the thing is there's lots of relevant content out there so there's like if, if i look at some of our competitors and i look at their search profile on something like ahrefs which is guesswork like ahrefs doesn't actually know what organic traffic is but it's got a better idea than no idea two of our biggest competitors have like if we took five percent of each of their traffic then we would hit that goal so there's loads of traffic on the grabs absolutely loads in, in legal and contracts and all this kind of stuff um and it's interesting i was trying to work out why it was because like so this is a bit of a digression but earlier today for the reasons that would not surprise anyone in my team i was googling whiskey shop and um, when i got the search results page there's no one bidding on that term i just found that so weird like no one's buying any traffic and i think it's there's probably some rule around ppc and alcohol or something where you can't by too much traffic but it did make me think about um the legal industry and like we sell to in-house lawyers not practice lawyers but if you think about a law firm like a name recognition law firm that we would have all heard of like slaughter and main let's say they don't really need to do any ppc or any keyword strategy at all because like the brand and the history and everything is what gets them customers so it just means like there's whole areas of legal where they've just not really been thoughtfully tested by SEO. Mm-hmm. So like, in, for example, in-house legal, huge, like it's an industry in itself. It's, I think the keyword difficulty is like 12 or something, <laughs> just because no, no one's bothered to rank it. And then when you look at some of the websites that you would think or you think would be good that are in our industry. So for example, there's a, a board called CLOCK, which is the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium just like this big body that sells everything to in-house legal the website is like trash it's awful and like i'm trying to work out why because i know some of this you need people there and their marketing they've got like one marketing person and the president at the time uh since gone to work for one of our competitors actually but i met her the other day and she said that she she pitched back when she was working at that place to try and hire me because we've we'd written a book about legal ops in the early days at juro and she couldn't get their head count. And it's like, you guys must, there must be so many millions of dollars pouring through this company and you have an awful website and no content. Like if you try even a little bit, <laughs> you could get more stuff. But then obviously they don't because that's not how they make money. They make money by running conferences and getting people to buy booths there and they're doing absolutely fine. Yeah. So yeah, there's, I'm not really worried about, about that kind of stuff because there's just loads of traffic at the graphs and we're going to take all of it or some, <laughs> some of it. That's a ni- nice landscape for you there, then. I guess, I guess. I mean, it, yeah, there's okay. like two competitors of ours who go to search and everyone else is rubbish. So, until that changes, mm. um, I'm confident. And I guess in general with Juro's SEO, you, you keep, it seems like hitting your goals like year on year on year. How how do you approach SEO? How did you approach it from the talk for that? Aggressively. So I think, it's kind of changed a bit over time because yeah. our website 
authority is improved. So it's in some ways it's easier than it was. But when you're a crappy website with domain authority of like 12, it's really hard to rank for anything. I guess the things I would say for search. So firstly, I only do search planning twice a year. Because that big exercise where you have to like really go deep into Ahrefs or whatever it is you use and do loads of key re- keyword research and have a massive spreadsheet, just takes ages and things don't change from the end of March to the beginning of April. And like I've probably mentioned this on calls before that I don't really believe in content calendars because you spend more time servicing them than you do actually doing stuff, particularly in search. So our content plan is just like a massive spreadsheet of 200 rows with intent and the proposed URL and the primary keyword, secondary keyword, like all this stuff, relevant competitive pages if we want to look at them. And then we should just try and prioritize it in terms of keyword difficulty and volume. But also there's a little bit of content curation in there. If you just mechanistically go for high intent terms and just smash out like 10 best alternatives to X over and over again, and your website's boring and crap and no one's going to read it so you do need a bit of variety so yeah once we have a plan we're very focused so Sophia on the call I don't really let her do anything else (laughs) except SEO (laughs) which is not limiting to her career at all but I think like if something's working just move everything out of their way and just like don't do other stuff so we do focus really really hard on search the other thing I would say is like go big especially if you're an earlier stage company like if you're a bank and you think you can write something and capture a really difficult keyword fine but this is b2b right so your best term might only drive like a thousand searches a month so it is a volume game so we're really aggressive like I think last week we published six new pieces and we're going to do eight this week quite, pieces quite you say it's six last week six last week eight this week eight this week wow yeah, because like if you want to move the needle with a lean team, you've got to be aggressive. So don't get me wrong, like if if we don't get to whatever number it is ahead of my training before, so it's not the end of the world. But um, if you, for example, let's say you work really hard to capture the term for you guys, whatever it is. So like in our case, a while ago, it's contract management software was like the thing. We wanted that search term. It was $40 a click if you paid for it. And we worked really hard and we got it and it took a year maybe. And we were number one in the UK and the US. And we're getting loads of demos through that and it was great and then we slipped to like four i think and like if that's your only strategy and you lose the ranking you're screwed now mm. so like the way you get to like in my experience anyway in, in a niche like we are quite a niche product the way you go from more to like 50k new users a month organic that are relevant is like 100 at a time because if you lose any of the individual rankings it doesn't really matter that much but it's very high risk to go after really big keywords. Like I think we've peaked at like second in the UK for electronic signature. And we were between DocuSign and Adobe Sign. And that's really cool. And I was very happy, but we can't keep that. Like there's no way we can, like we can or should be outranking DocuSign for e-signature. Um, and like we, a lot of the traffic would just bounce, go back to the results page by DocuSign. <laughs> so you've got to be quite aggressive, I think. Also, intent segmentation. So if you don't have an idea of what are the key priorities in your content plan, just segment it and then you have a better idea of what you need to focus on. I would say don't be distracted by vanity metrics or platforms. So I'm a big HRF fan, and we also use SU ranking because it has a really nice day-to-day ranking exchange functionality for quite a good price. But both of those are guessing. So you've got to be quite clear eyed that like the only thing that's real is search console to an extent and then like your actual Google Analytics, what actually happens on your website. Because it's easy to write something and get super excited that you captured the ranking, but if it's not giving you any traffic, it doesn't really matter. But and equally you might have loads of rankings, but your H1s are so poor that people don't click through. So there's not any point being number one in Google if you have a click-through rate from the results page of like 0.1%. So really try and follow everything down the funnel until you get to traffic. And traffic is like the top of the funnel. So it's like the pre-funnel before they get to the site. And then there's the actual funnel when they get to the site. So you really got to work out which numbers are just making you feel good rather than actually having a business impact. And then the last thing I would say is particularly with the last algorithm update, we've realized that like especially with mid and low difficulty keywords on page beats off page these days there's not a huge amount of point spending loads of time building backlinks or at least it's less important than it used to be because we've captured some quite difficult keywords with just good content and then internal linking i used to spend a lot of time 
building backlinks. And don't get me wrong, it's still worthwhile, but it's not like you don't need them anymore the way you used to need them. Mm. So you like get your list of your keywords and then you optimize for on page and a little bit of backlink stuff. Is that still part of like the checklist of how you're going after them? It doesn't hurt. Like if it's a difficult keyword, probably. Yeah. And also if the person owning the keyword currently is like a university or a really good SaaS vendor or something, yeah. you're probably going to need a bit of juice to beat them. But you used to be able to outrank good companies by just going hard on backlinks. Mm. And I think that's less easy these days. Like you can have all the backlinks. Like you see it in Ahrefs if you look at the backlink profile on the SERPs bit at the bottom there. So like really lightly linked stuff will be ranked at the top just based on the authority of the website. So yeah, less important to just peg links all the time, but I still do it. And, and so you mentioned like your traffic's almost like your top of the funnel and then people have landed onto your content. What What's the goal then if it's, if you're not going to convert to a demo, do they go into any other funnels? Well, there's a few conversions. So the one we want is obviously demo. So I think okay. something mad like 80% of our revenue comes through demo requests or something. Crazy like that. But obviously not everyone wants to request a demo and we're actually not great at nurture. So a sophisticated, like capture details, give them an automated nurture workflow, bring them back when they're ready to buy. We're not super good at that. We use community for nurture instead. But the other conversion mechanisms we have are lower intent content gating things. So like contract templates we started doing and then, you know, classic ebook, white paper, stuff like that. People are super down on gated content at the moment. It's like really fun on LinkedIn, apparently. It's just like trash gated content. But if you go on Salesforce, they still do it. And I think they know what they're doing. So it's horses for courses. Don't gate something rubbish and expect someone to buy. And also don't expect someone to respond to a phone call when they've... Like I, I downloaded an ebook the other day and I got a phone call before I could open the PDF. <laughs> And I know who the guy is because somehow it's pound his, you know, he like, he's called me about 12 times and I just ignored him. And then he emailed me as if he'd never called me and just sent me a cold email. And then my phone knows through the app that it's this guy. I just downloaded the ebook and the phone rang. It's like, this is terrible sales time. Um, so just be honest with yourself about what lower intent leads are ready to do, but they're still valuable. Yeah. I hope that's answered your question, Luke, because I saw you just popped on about how you feel about gating content. Yes, but I'm a fan. It's like vinyl, you know? Still <laughs> <place>. so. <laughs> do you and do you see do you tend to have blog content as ungated and then you've just got some juicy guides and ebooks that are the gated ones? Yeah, pretty much. And I think people well, I can't I don't know what it's like in other industries, but like in our vertical, people get it. Like they know that if they are having to give up their email address and perhaps their phone number. They know they're doing that because we want to sell to them and they do it anyway. So if your content was bad, then they just respond really angrily to the follow-up where they'd be like, oh, I gave up my phone number, I'm getting called by some 23-year-old for this. That would be really annoying. But if, like in, in our case, if like Sana spends three months producing something absolutely unique, that's amazing, that gives them exactly what they need to do their jobs better. Of course, they're gonna to have to give us something for it. Yeah. Like, uh, like maybe they, they wouldn't, but there's definitely nothing wrong with us asking for something. And I think even though, like there's this big conversation on LinkedIn at the moment driven by one company in particular that like, stop doing lead gen, stop doing demand gen. And I find it really annoying. It's like positioning as if you have just discovered this unique secret that like, high intent leads are better than low intent leads <laughs> like of, of course they are <laughs> but like you want all of them you know I, don't, I think if you've not been trying to get high intent leads before i'm sorry if you, you should have but like now that you are doing don't forget about people who aren't ready to buy because you're going to need them at some point which if someone's at the beginning of their content creation journey which part should they begin with low intent or high intent Content. Depends what the company strategy is. I think if if it's a marketing led company and you're like you're expecting what you do at work to drive revenue, mm-hmm. start with high intent and work outwards. But it's it's hard because if you have no brand trust and no one knows who you are, mm. it's pretty hard to convert people. You, you might get leads, but only win five percent of them because like you seem like chances who are just good at search. So 
there's definitely value in doing some lower intent brand things just to position yourselves as like a real company that people can trust before you try and sell to them. So it sort of depends on your, your brand visibility, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, obviously you've put a lot of work into SEO, so people finding your content through organic, but how else do you distribute your content, especially if, like a lot of the marketing playbooks suggest sharing on like LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. but your audience are lawyers and I imagine maybe they're not on those channels as often, so how, how do you approach distribution? <laughs> lawyers, lawyers don't tweet unless they're barristers. <laughs> they time on that. Good question. So Twitter, useless. LinkedIn, like it's okay uh, for lawyers, like if it's, if they're anywhere, they'd be on LinkedIn, but most of them aren't. Mm-hmm. And especially the ones that we sell to are just quite busy. It's quite rare they'd be super engaged LinkedIn people because they're too busy, like doing really important things at the company. So LinkedIn can be helpful, especially in the early stages, because you have a, if you leverage it right, you can have a bigger reach than you have just on your own. But the way, like so, so the only two distribution things or three distribution things we do, like PPC, obviously we do paid, but we try and spend most of that on high intent traffic. So demo requests and stuff. Mm-hmm. Obviously SEO, like 7 billion searches every day. So just get your slice of them. But the best way to distribute things is to earn their waves. So that's what our community group is about. So just become personal friends with all of your perfect customers and then give them stuff directly. And it's kind of a weird one because like, so if you're trying to do attribution, the community group would never look like, it would look like it never does anything because it's almost never the acquisition route. We've already converted them somehow mm. in some other way. And then we get them in the group. But if you earn the airways, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about like competitors downloading stuff or law firms following their clients around or consultants wasting their time or any of that garbage. Just everyone in there is perfect. Can, can you touch a bit more on what you what this community is and what you offer people? Yeah, what, what is the Duro community? Mm. Yeah, let me give you like the 45 second history. So lawyers love croissants. So we used to run breakfasts like every month, maybe at the Modern Pantry. You get like 12 lawyers in a room with some people from the company, you buy more breakfast. One of them becomes a customer in like month one of one person buying, it's paid for itself. Great. Then there's this bloody COVID thing. So we all had to stay at home for a while and we had to stop doing breakfast. And we were thinking, like, how do we capture this sort of goodwill thing we have where we know lawyers and we want to talk to them all the time? So we started a Slack group and, well, firstly, we had a strategy and worked out the, like, success metrics and all of the important stuff. But, yeah, we found all of our soft targets, so customers we knew would be happy to join, like, friends of the company kind of thing, and made very personalised outreach to get in the group. And we just tried as quickly as possible to get to, like, 100 members. And we were very transparent with them. We're like, you're going to walk into an empty room, which is going to seem rubbish. So don't worry. <laughs> it gets better. And thankfully it did. And then, so we got to 100. We, we were holding a few early calls and stuff, but we're still quite vulnerable to drop offs with events. So then we were like, we need to get to 500. <laughs> so we went absolutely crazy. Sana took years off our life, just DMing people all the time. And then eventually we got to 500 members. And now it's self-sustaining, just grows organically, which is really good. And we do closed door events for them, like round tables, virtual stuff. And there's a curated jobs board. Much of this I learned from you, Christina. Um, but then we also had a 120 person conference for them in May, which was really cool. And then we've got something else coming up in October in the real world as well. Nice. And does the community link to some of the content that you do? So when you're having these round tables of virtual stuff, does that then become content that you use? Very much so. So there's, we repurpose the events into a quarterly magazine that Sana edits, and then we repurpose that into the blog. It's a nice virtuous cycle. And, you know, the community gives us speakers for the events and introduces us to other people. But the best thing about the community group is the close rate on SQL to community members is like 64%. Mm. So if someone's, if someone's in the group, they're just like more than twice as likely to buy than if they're not. And if they don't buy, but they're still in the group if they didn't buy because there's some product feature we don't have then they get an email from me every monday where i can tell them we've got the new product feature so it's pretty great nice it's a lot of work though <laughs> communities are a lot of work yes i agree but yeah that's a nice nice loop that you've got going i've just got a couple more questions from my end and then yeah if anyone's got any others 
as I said, do shout out. This is more about your career in content because you've been been in the game for a while. So if somebody is pretty new to being a content marketer, what advice would you get them to grow into head of content role? Oh, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all. Well, I think to be like ready to be ahead of or to be to actually be ahead of them and to prove value to the company that you should be ahead of. Let's say if you're internally a content manager and you think you should be ahead of content, it sort of depends whether there is one or you're pitching that that role should exist and you should expand the team. In my experience, like almost all of those decisions come down to, can you show somebody a piece of paper that has a dollar sign on top of it and a strategy underneath it that makes the dollar sign go up? And do they believe that you can deliver it? And if you can be out ahead of how strategic you need to be, then it's really helpful. So let's say you're in a writing role now. Have you started pitching ideas? Have you started like tracking the impact of your content all the way through the funnel? Have you already got ideas for next quarter about how like, okay, this this isn't working this quarter, but if you scale that kind of content, I think it might work here's why. Like, have you spoken to the sales team about what they want? Like just generally getting buy-in for the idea that you are a strategic person and not just like a deliverer of words. That's super helpful. Mm-hmm. And then I think, the other way to do it is like if, if you're currently like the, the other way is like become invaluable to a company as a freelancer and then you become so invaluable they try and hire you that's what happened to me because like if there's a void of content strategy and it seems like you're adding value especially at a venture back company if it seems like this thing is going to work and drive off they probably need you more than you need them it's really mm-hmm. hard to hire early stage people mm-hmm. so like you know, if they're like, oh, I think we need a content manager. Would you want to join us full time? Just say, I will, if it's ahead of content. Well, see what happens. Because you've got a bit more power in the early stages than you do at late stages. The only thing I would say is do go in with your eyes open. Because if you're ahead of and your function actually grows, there will be a point when you stop really doing that much creative work yourself. And you get mm-hmm. other people to do it. And then it's really hard at first. <laughs> do you miss doing the actual nitty gritty of content sometimes yeah I still do it sometimes oh, yeah. like there's a point last quarter where I was just quite stressed about stuff so I just started writing some search content <laughs> just <laughs> it. Um, as a de-stressor just like, yeah just like check I still got it you know? so yeah I think I do miss it but and there's certain high value things that I might still get involved with like if we have a fundraising press release or like our CEO was on Sky News and he wanted a media briefing. So like certain things you might keep back for yourself. Mm. But you've got to be really careful with that because if you've got a team and you want to develop them and you want to show that you're invested in them and you trust them and you think they're like really great and you want them to move to the next level, you can't keep back high quality work for yourself. It's really demotivating. Mm-hmm. So you've got to do like our CEO has just got a column in Forbes and um, of course he's not writing it, but I'm not writing it either, so I'm writing it. Nice. How, how do you approach ensuring your team members are thriving and growing? Oh, who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pay rises, um, I hope. <laughs> no comment. But I think, like, firstly, it's really stupid, but like, ask them. Yeah. Like, if you, if you don't have a good idea of where people want to go in their career and you're not asking them, like, at least every quarter, you're just building up risk because, mm-hmm. like, all marketing jobs have a shelf life. Like there'll be a day when I don't work at Jura and like you know if people want to leave because like it's kind of like be- being a session musician for Paul McCartney like how many times can you play hey Jude? <laughs> like, eventually you just you want to go and do something else so like there's nothing wrong if people just want to change that's fine but if like what were highly motivated motivated engaged talented people leave because they feel the company can't give them what they want progression wise or like financially and you didn't realize that it's really bad because mm. like you just have to ask and they just have to tell you and it's not that like you can always make whatever anyone wants happen for them but like it's certainly in my personal experience feeling heard goes a really long way and uh, the most surprised anyone I've ever quit on has been was when like it just was a bit out of the blue and I'd given him like a really clear roadmap of what we needed to do in order to improve the thing we were doing and he asked me to do that and then he just never actioned any of it and it was all it was like give me some ideas for this but try and make them free which is quite a hard ask and I came up with some stuff and he just never replied to my email I was like you know what I'm out um 
and I left. So just making sure you actually talk to people about they want what they want in their lives and their careers is very important. Yeah, excellent tip. Questions? Yes, we do. So Luke is saying, are you still where the butt stops for content approvals? How do you manage that as part of your day to day? Yes, I am for the most part. But I think depending on how good a job you're doing of coaching or guidance and training and stuff like that, your job becomes, okay, let's get this from 70% to 100% to let's get this from 95 to 100%. And that review process is a lot quicker now. So like, I'm not going to call out which members of the team I work with get to sniff on, but like, Often the actual stuff that needs finessing at the end is really minor. It's like design changes or just like that last few percent that makes it really, really good. And the subject matter expertise and the understanding of our persona is, is good enough that I don't really need to get involved there. But yeah, you, you've got to, you know, if it was a journalistic function and you're an editor, you stand behind your writers and you're like the shield. So yeah, I kind of take responsibility for everything that gets published, but try not to slow it down too much. <laughs> Answer your question, Luke. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Nice. And one from Alan here as well. Do you have a buyer type that is very difficult to reach with content and or community? Or will those lawyers just never buy? So you identify them early and then leave them alone? Good question. Well, with the community, I'm not going to say they're easy to reach, but like it's very specific, the group. Like being an in-house lawyer is quite lonely. And if you're at a scaling company, you might join as the first lawyer and you go from like 10 to 50 salespeople and you'll go from one to two lawyers and you'll manage the other lawyer. So in terms of actually having peers you can confide in, it's quite a lonely role. So we find that the once people understand the proposition of the group, like, do you want to be in a Slack group with 500 people do the exact same thing you do? They're like, that sounds good, no downside. And they ask each other questions and it's really good. So convincing them to join the community is one thing convincing them to buy is is a bit different because the main limiter there is actually not our reach it's product coverage like we still disqualify a lot of leads based on things we can't do in the product um so yeah i think i mean hopefully there'll be like a magic moment in because we hired a, a new cto recently who's brilliant and we're speeding up a bit in in shipping features and like Probably everyone's seen this. He's worked on a marketing team, but you just think if we could just drop that qualification criteria, we'd like double the amount of people we could qualify in. And maybe we'll do that with some product advances. I mean, there are some people who will never, because of the kind of person they are, and it's laughing because she knows exactly who I'm thinking about. <laughs> there's, there's one particular person who's come back and requested demo like 40 times or whatever. And it's sort of like a, a running joke in the company, like he was been thrown this hospital pass this time <laughs> and who will have an unstructured conversation with them and inevitably DQ them because you can't make decisions. People like that, you just learn to spot over time and don't worry about them. But it's still keep them in the group. You never know. Because they might bring in someone in their team and then empower them to make that decision. And then you don't have to worry about their paralysis, personality vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we do have quite strict sales qualification criteria. So we get a lot of interest from consultants and from law firms. And they're always like, no, there is a use case. Honestly, like there's a thing we want to use to product for. It never goes anywhere. So over the years, we've just learned to be like, sorry, we can't help you. Thanks. Please subscribe. Yeah. And kick them out. High cool. qualification barrier. So one other quick question. Do you speak to innovation teams at law firms as well? And oh, not if I can help it. <laughs> is that a dead end? Well, it, like if we sold to law firms, it would be a dream because they're pretty much there to buy technology. It would try and pretend they can build it themselves. And if you go to a legal tech conference, like Legal Geek or any of the big ones, about a third of the people there are in innovation laws and law firms. The problem is like, we just can't help them at all. And we're not interested in them. <laughs> so, like they're interesting to talk to you. And if they go in house and they know about us, which is why we always get them to subscribe, then that's great. Cause they've got, they're obviously believers in technology and they'd be open to bringing something in. But we'd usually always ignore them. And, and like, I've spoken to a few of them a bit, but they're like, oh, I've got this client in mind and I think maybe they'd be into it. So could maybe you could show us and it's like, just bring the client. We'll just do a demo for them. We don't need you, which obviously they're not always, always willing to do. But um, yeah, I'm just, it's, it's like a really weird one. But if you think about where the power lies in a law firm, it's very depressing, but you can just picture the people who make decisions in law firms that have big monetary consequences. It's probably like 
some grey dude. And the people in innovation teams are usually quite young and quite energetic. <laughs> I just don't believe they can help us, so we, we tend to ignore them. Cool. That's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just noticed, Alan, you'd submitted another question before, but I'll put to you as well, Tom, which was, what do, layers, what do lawyers think of AI, the future, a scam or not asked? Not yeah, asked. so a bit of background. I've just started working with a, a law kind of legal tech client who do kind of AI contract review. So I'm trying to understand the, the lawyer's mentality a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Like, who are the well, goods? Who are the, the people who are kind of pushing the field? AI contract review is a good one. So like, I thought about this before the call. So uh, the future of scam, like a lot of problem A, a lot of problem B. I think there is a lot of enthusiasm, particularly from law firms. And there's not a huge amount behind the hype with the exception of contract review. So most of the AI promises are like over-promise, under-deliver. They're just, they're, the OCR and stuff is just not quite good enough to actually, like it still needs to be manually, the work still needs to be manually checked. So like, what's the point in paying for something. Contract review is a bit different in that like if you have 10,000 PDFs and you need to find all your identity clauses, like it's great. It's kind of the same as e-discovery in that like it's a very obvious application there where if you're dealing with a vast amount of like shitty old documents that were never designed with structured search in mind, getting AI to read them can be just like a great application of AI. The one thing I would say, and I would say this because of the company I work at, is like it's a really good solution, but it's a self-made problem because the reason you need to like get AI to review all your PDFs for you is that you made PDFs. <laughs> so PDFs are not structured data, so they're not searchable. So if you just stopped storing all your important info in PDFs, you wouldn't need to buy contract AI review to read your contracts for you. So the format we have for documents in Jura is digital. So just search and then you just get 100% accurate results. But like, obviously that's a forward looking solution. Almost all the contracts in the world have, are like backward looking. So there's a huge addressable pain point there, but big companies mainly, not small companies. Cool, thank you. Good Jura pitch as well. <laughs> great, I mean, this, the, great, great pitch an, there at the end. <laughs> the, the other area where AI yeah, has got a really great application is like, like justice, civil justice, the courts, public sector. It's just adoption in the public sector is incredibly slow. Like a, the vendor, the big company I used to work for did the digitization of the courts at the Rolls building. And that sounded really cool to me. And then I went down there and saw it and I was like, there's some computers here now. <laughs> it's like the pace of change is just really slow in the MOJ. Um, so there's a, a big opportunity there, but it's going to take Christ knows how long to actually get get something happening there. Cool. I think that's a good time to wrap up. But thank you very much, Tom, for all of your big insights across SEO and your career and everything. I really appreciate it. It's um, my absolute pleasure. If anyone ever wants to ask me anything, just DM me in the Slack group. Thank you. And thanks for joining everybody. Appreciate um, it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.